Check one, check two. Hello. Hi, Daniel Wilson, Patrick Gunnels. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are you doing, sir? Fine, thank you. I see that you've got the same microphone as I have. Yeti microphone. Nice, nice, very good. Most popular microphone in all of YouTube history. Mm -hmm. So thank you for joining me today. I, I didn't send you a reminder. I apologize about that. But uh, I guess we could just go ahead and get started. Uh, no, so um, I'm recording this and I'll just upload it unedited to the YouTube channel. I don't really have any video editing software anyway. So I'm just going to pump this out unedited. If you'd like to upload it to your channel as well, you absolutely can. I'll be sending it to you. Sure. Does that sound good to you? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'll just go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody, to a debate between me, Patrick Gunnels, from the Reading Epic Threads YouTube channel, to Dr. Wilson of Debunk the Funk, another YouTube channel. And today we are going to be discussing the topic, debate topic resolution, if you will, resolved that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is real and causes a well-defined illness. And I will let you go ahead and get started. Oh, me? Oh. Yep, you bet. Go right ahead. Let us let my audience know what the uh, the arguments in favor of that position are. OK, uh, well, I mean, there's mountains of evidence that uh, there is a novel coronavirus that is spreading throughout the global population. And we have identified it. We've characterized it. Who's and we? we? The scientific community. Global scientific community. All right. So, so labs all over. So can labs all around the world. For my audience, can you be more specific about that? I mean, several labs all over the world uh, have identified this virus and characterized it, both biochemically, genetically, and structurally. And we've been able to come uh, identify a specific pathogenesis that this virus causes in humans as well, with unique uh, pathology that we've learned from examining tissues, autopsies, things like that. Um, and so I'm not really sure like, you know, where the disagreement is. So it, it would be helpful for me to hear from you, you know, what you think is unclear about whether or not uh, SARS-CoV-2 actually exists. T okay, well, tell me about the process for separating out a virus from a sample of tissue to determine the presence of the virus and then a, the determination of causative nature between that virus and a well-defined disease. That's what we're looking for here. How does that work? So typically what's done is a patient will have an illness. So like what happened in Wuhan, they had flu-like symptoms uh, they were admitted to a hospital. Doctors tried to figure out what's going on, what's making this patient sick. And so um, the patient will be tested for a variety of different pathogens, including bacteria, viruses, so forth. And when they don't find any known virus or any known bacteria that can be causing that illness, then they will uh, take a sample from the patient they will grow that patient, they will filter that sample uh, if they're looking for a virus. So they filter it in order to clean out all the bacteria, all of the human cells, all that stuff. And then they add that filtrate to a cell culture. So in that cell culture, uh, as we know, viruses need host cells in order to survive. Uh, unlike bacteria, they actually need to be, they need to hijack host cell machinery so once in that uh, cell culture, the virus will begin to grow. From that point, we can much more easily characterize it. We can sequence its genome de novo, which means we can sequence its genome without knowing what it actually is. We can do biochemistry to uh, determine what kind of proteins the virus is made up of. We can then do experiments with animals or cell culture to- Experiments. What experiments have taken place with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus? Tons of experiments. So- No, no, um, no, 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 no. Just name one what, for me, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, plaque assays. 
is one that's commonly done with uh, viruses and cell culture. If you don't mind my, just for my audience, tell me what it, what is the definition of an experiment? To an, experiment an experiment is to, is to test an observation. Oh, okay, okay. Or to test a uh, prediction rather. No, no, test no, 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 no. I, I think the actual definition is the, the uh, establishment of cause and effect for an observed phenomenon. Uh, is the definition that I have most commonly read. So if I, if you're going to talk about experiments, I'd like us to start out and just find out what the elements of the experiment that you're going to be discussing today. So let us first begin with what is the observed phenomenon? In what context? In what case? You just talked about an experiment. Well, oh, oh for plaque assays? No, 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 no. I asked you, mm -hmm. what is the evidence that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is real and causes a well-defined illness? You have now said that there are experiments. I would like you to pick one, discuss the naturally occurring phenomenon the hypo and the hypothesis, and then how that hypothesis was tested. Okay. Um, so I, I mentioned plaque assay. So the way plaque assay is done is is Just, i'm trying to find out what the naturally occurring phenomenon observed is first the plaque assay seems to be part of the testing phase am i right it's an experiment done to test whether or not a virus is present in a sample, specifically how many viral particles are present in a sample. I'm not even there yet. I just need to get to what the observed natural phenomenon is for the experiment that you're talking about. Because we haven't even we haven't even gotten past that point. We can't even have a hypothesis unless we can have an observation. So I'm just wondering, what's the observation? What is observed that can be tested? So, okay, so you, are you asking me to explain plaque assay or do you want me to explain a different experiment? I'm, I'm asking you to tell me. The necessary antecedent for any experiment is that something is observed. Can you tell me what has been observed? We observed that an illness is linked with a pathogenic unit called a virus. No, 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 no. So you just said an observation and a conclusion in the same sentence. So we observe the illness. What, what, okay, tell me about this illness. So you're telling me that the observed phenomenon is an illness, is that correct? If you, yeah, sure. Okay, well, no, this is important because if we're gonna talk about an experiment, we need to talk about an observed phenomenon. Right. So is, that, is that what you're, you're talking about, right? I'm talking right. about a virus. Okay, so I'm going to push back on that and say that this illness has never been properly characterized. Before we can even talk about pathogenesis or causative agents, can you please tell me, and then I'm going to talk to you about that, how has the supposed novel illness been characterized? And then I need, I need citations for that. How has the illness been characterized? So Yes, that's what I said. It's been characterized by clinical laboratories all over the world, doctors. So, I mean, no worries. Let me, I don't know let me what kind. I don't know what Can kind of experiment you're looking for. I'm asking you to tell me the observed phenomenon, which means <laughs> you need to tell me what the illness is. Describe it for me. Oh, is okay. it well defined? Sorry, my, yeah, my so, mistake. So it's flu-like symptoms, characterized by severe lung damage characterized by uh, a high immune, an overactive immune response in those tissues. And then we can actually find the specific pathogen in the human body. Right, okay. I just need you to tell me the illness. We can get to the, the hypothesized cause in a second. So if I'm to understand this correctly, you're saying the observed phenomenon is respiratory flu-like symptoms, that, that's a little bit general, but we'll, we'll stick with it for now. Extreme lung damage, mm -hmm. uh, immune response of so cytokine storm. Yes. Now, everything I know about medicine indicates that that is a way to characterize an absolutely enormous number 
of illnesses. Sure. So oh. if that's the case, then how do you have a, a well-defined phenomenon to test first? If you've got something that could be all sorts of things, it is not well-defined because there are many other things, other diseases that it could be. Pneumonia and cytokine storm are not new. There's nothing novel about those things. Right, but finding all those things without a cause, without an obvious cause, is new. Oh, finding all those things without an obvious cause is new? Are, are you sure about that? Because in general, mm -hmm. when I... When I, okay, well, I'm going to push back on that because in general, doctors don't start testing for viruses and various bacteria when you go to the doctor. They just toss you an antibiotic and hope you get better. That's, that's how medicine actually gets practiced in the real world in general. So, well, so, it de so it depends on the case. So if someone's hospitalized, then they're going to figure out what's wrong with you. If you go to the doctor and it's just your PCP, you know, they're, they'll, they might say, PC okay, you- PCP? personal care practitioner. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. They might, they might say, okay, you're, you're ill. Um, but it's probably a bacterial infection or they might actually send out some samples to a clinical lab to get some confirmation on that. And they'll send you home with antibiotics. And if it's a virus, you know, they might also do lab work and they might actually test for virus or they might test for bacteria, see if there's no bacteria they'll just treat you with um, antibiotics to prevent a bacterial infection from, you know, co-infecting you with a virus. If you're right. hospitalized, if you're hospitalized now, then that's much more serious. They're going to try to figure out what's wrong. And in the case of the first patient in Wuhan that was identified to have this SARS-CoV-2. Who, who claimed, didn't know who's who's making wrong. the claim about the patient zero in Wuhan? What, what do you, what claim? There is a claim that there is a patient zero in Wuhan exhibiting certain characteristics. Tell me who's making that claim. So this wouldn't be patient zero. This would be the first patient that the virus was actually identified from. Okay. Who difference. claims uh, to have identified it in Wuhan? There is a publication. Uh, out. Who? Who? What's the publication? I mean, I can pull it up for you, but... What? Okay. Here's the problem that I have. <laughs> so it, you're asking an enormous amount of faith from my audience telling me that there is a publication made by a lab on the other side of the world and you don't even know who it is who made the claim i mean i know what the paper is i can literally pull it up for you if you like obviously um do you want me to do that i can do yes that. please and i'll make you the host i want you to share that paper with us sure all right So I will share my screen. Let's see. A novel coronavirus from patients with pneumonia in China. Okay, so the observed phenomenon is pneumonia. Is, is that correct? So they were admitted with pneumonia. It was of unknown cause. And so they were trying to figure out what was causing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's flu-like symptoms. So with, take me to the part where they actually isolate the virus, please. Sure. So viral diagnostic methods, you can read through all these methods. All right. Uh, isolation, isolation. Perfect. Virus. Perfect. All right. Isolation. Of, what we seem to be on the isolation of virus stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So bronchial lavage fluid, that means fluid that washed out um, the patient's lungs. It's not a very comfortable procedure, but this fluid was collected into sterile cups. And then the samples were centrifuged in this case to remove all the cellular debris, all the bacteria cells, all the extra things other than viruses that we know could cause illness. No, no, stop. Let's, let's just for my audience to make sure that they understand all of this. Mm -hmm. The supernatant was inoculated on human airway epithelial cells, which had been obtained from airway specimens resected from patients undergoing surgery for lung cancer and were confirmed to be special pathogen free by NGS. How were they confirmed to be special pathogen free? Uh, so this is next gen sequencing. So they were sequenced mm -hmm. in order to look for any known pathogens. Okay. So, so sequencing methods, we did not find any genome of any known pathogens in these human epithelial cells. This is a cell line. So cell lines are 
standardized. They're um, tested to make sure that they're well characterized so that we know what we're working with mm -hmm. when we're culturing them. Mm -hmm. So this happens to be human cells from a uh, human respiratory tract. And so naturally that's the kind of cell line that, excuse me, a virus that causes pneumonia might infect. So they add this sample, this cleaned up sample to a uh, cell line, and then they begin to see, they begin to see, well, in the results section, you'll see that they begin to see different cytopathic effects. Please, please uh, don't, don't take me away from the section that says, isolation of the virus. That's what we're focused on right now. Okay. So it says, so what you're saying is that samples of tissue from people with lung cancer. No, no. So uh, this is, the sample was taken from uh, the patient. The sample that ultimately contained whatever might be causing the illness was taken mm -hmm. from the patient. Mm -hmm. And Again, since viruses, which is one of the things that they look for, uh, can't exist outside of host cells. Well, they can't replicate outside of host cells. Uh, they had to try to grow the virus in a cell culture. So okay. you can culture uh, cell lines in the lab in uh, flasks. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, that's what you're seeing from, uh, from the cancer patient here. Well, I just, okay. so. Bronchioalveolar lavage fluid samples were collected in sterile cups to which virus transport medium was added. Samples were then centrifuged to remove cellular debris. The supernatant was inoculated on human airway epithelial cells, mm -hmm. which had been obtained from airway specimens, resected from patients undergoing surgery for lung cancer, and were confirmed to be special pathogen free by NGS. Is there anything there that, that, that needs to be explained? Because it seems to me that the human airway epithelial cells are from lung cancer patients. Yeah, and there, there's a reason for that because when you culture a cell line, you want it to, okay, uh, go ahead. No, please continue. So when you culture a cell line, you want it to be immortal. And one of the ways you immortalize uh, cell lines is to culture cancer cells. Cancer cells will divide indefinitely. So that's why it's from a cancer patient. So, so this cell line can be used by a lab indefinitely in order to grow things like viruses. I'm obviously already seeing something that can't be taken as reliable. The fact that we're using cancer cells to show that a a virus caused pneumonia? So it we're doesn't seem very scientific to me. No, it, it, so <laughs> these are host cells. We're giving, the vi we're giving the virus a host to grow in so that we can study it once we take it from you're, you're giving, patient that is. Now, hang on. You're giving a supernatant that has suspected virus in it to a host cell. Right. It, seems so as if it, all, it also seems as if you're assuming that there's virus in this supernatant. Well, in order to test whether or not there is virus there, this is what you would have to do. So right. if, we, if there is a virus there, we should be able to add this supernatant to a cell line and see the virus affect that cell line. If there's no virus there, we should see no effects and we should not be able to pull a virus from it. What would the effects be if there is virus there? So you would get, if the virus is able to kill the cells, you would see plaques which are zones of clearance in the cells. So they grow in a mono layer at the bottom of the flask. And you can actually see it with your naked eye. You can see the cells growing in the flask. And when the virus, is, when the virus lands on the cells and starts dividing and killing them, you can see zones of clearance, a circle of no cells start to This, is, a, this is an assumption of cause. You are assuming that a virus is the thing killing the cells. Well, How there's nothing else there that could kill the cells. Uh, okay, let's take a look at what else is put into those cells. Prior to infection, apical surfaces of the human airway epithelial cells were washed three times with phosphate buffered saline, mm -hmm. 150 microliters of supernatant from bronchioalveolar fluid, uh, lavage fluid samples was inoculated under the apical surface of the cell cultures. 
-hmm. After a two hour incubation at 37 Celsius, unbound virus was removed. How can unbound virus be removed if it hasn't even been identified to be there? So unbound, un it's saying any, any virus that did not enter the cells was removed in the wash. How on earth would they know that? Well, they don't at this point. At this point, it's, this, is, uh, this is again testing whether or not a virus is there. So in order to see if a virus is there, you allow time for the virus to infect the cells at a natural temperature. And then any virus that does not infect the cells is removed in a wash. So if a virus was able to infect in that two hour time period, then you see effects from that virus on the cells that it infected. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is all on just one patient, am I right? This is, this this is, is supernatant from one patient with, with so no. It's, it's a, so it's a sample taken from the patient and yes, spun one, down, supernatant. One patient. Mm -hmm. one patient. One patient. Added, okay. yes. Okay. This is one patient so far. So you're telling me that people took a sample of somebody in Wuhan with pneumonia, uh -huh. then proceeded to use lung cancer cells and washed out the young lung cancer cells and used sequencing to determine that those lung cancer cells were completely free of any pathogen of any kind, and then took a sample supernatant from one person with pneumonia and were able to determine that a novel coronavirus had caused that pneumonia. Are you serious? Oh. Well, there's more to it than that. We haven't gotten to all the experiments they did in order to confirm. No, 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 no. We're talking about one experiment, this one. First of all, I can't even identify a well-defined naturally occurring phenomenon because apparently the naturally occurring phenomenon is just pneumonia. How it's on earth pneumonia. could they have, a, how on earth could they have eliminated all other possible causes of pneumonia? So. Cytokine storm. Yeah. So. Normally there's a cause for these things. If someone is admitted to a hospital with severe pneumonia and you're a doctor, you wanna figure out what's wrong with them so you can properly treat them. If it's a bacterial pneumonia, then you definitely wanna give them the proper antibiotics to treat them. If it's a viral pneumonia, you wanna know what virus it is so that you can take the proper course. So begging when they the question. To... Begging the question, okay? The question remains, we have the observed phenomenon being pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And so far we have just the one patient and we're trying just to get through one experiment and I can't even get to the point where they're actually doing anything that would isolate any real cause. This looks like pseudoscience from here. Okay, well, I can help you get there. So um, I'm not sure where you're confused because- No, 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 no. A... I, I've been very, very clear. Mm -hmm. One sample from one person with pneumonia was taken. Yes, this is it the original then, identification it of the virus. It was then put through a centrifuge. Uh -huh. At this point, no virus has been identified. Then virus put onto cancer cells. And then- What's wrong? What, you, you seem to be hung up on the cancer cells. What's wrong with that? Well, the fact that cells are cancerous makes them abnormal cells. They just grow extraordinarily fast. They make perfect mediums for this kind of experiment because if you are working with if, if there weren't immortal cell lines to work with, you'd have to take fresh cells from a patient every time you want to make a cell culture in order to study a virus. Okay. You seem, very, you seem very upset with that. I don't understand. You're using, you're using abnormal cells. What, and what's prove... wrong with, they're very well characterized cells. Mm -hmm. They're abnormal to the human body, but in a dish, we can study them and characterize them and know you know, what they do. All right. And so, producing an unknown virus is not something that they do. How do you know that? I, I mean, we've never observed an unknown virus emerge from a cell line that we know the full, se full genome sequence of. It doesn't sound like anything really is being observed at all, but please continue. Okay. Well, we observe that when we take a sample that should contain any virus from this patient who has pneumonia of unknown cause, and we do things with it that allow us to grow a virus that might be there, we see a virus in fact grow. You're just asserting that. So far, all we've got is, is abnormal cells being, being treated with somebody, somebody's 
lung fluid who has so, pneumonia. So this, the, again, these cancer cells are well characterized and you can do a control experiment where you add nothing. You add just, PB, just phosphate buffered saline to the cells instead of a patient sample. And okay, where was that done? That effect. That's done internally. It's all, it's done in all of the, this is a cell, cell culture is something that's done every day all over the world. You don't see viruses emerge from cells just from adding PBS or any of these other components that are commonly used in cell culture. Why, but why wasn't this, where, where's the control group done? I mean, these are, again, these are epithelial lung cells that are cultured. So there have to be multiple flasks of these passaged in order to get to a point where you can actually use them for an experiment. Throughout all that passaging, they did not, they did not produce a, an unknown virus. So far, as far as I can, I can tell, no experiment has even taken place. We have, a, we have, we have nonspecific respiratory distress followed by taking some lung fluid and putting it on top of cancer cells. So how else would you identify a virus? Is there okay. another way? Okay. Well, number one, you'd have to have a large, in order for this to be actually scientific, which is nothing that's happening here, you would have to have an enormous number of people a large sample of people all so, exhibiting so this, the exact same symptoms. Two. So this, you, mm -hmm. yeah, we have that. So this. You, ha would, so this. you would have to You would have to isolate the virus using a scent. You, you'd have to isolate the. You'd have to isolate the hypothetical pathogen using a centrifuge, and you wouldn't have to go through this cancer cell rigmarole to produce it. It would be able to be isolated within a centrifuge without going through this ridiculous oh. process with these, with these okay. so, abnormal so you... cells. And so none of these things has happened here. The scientific method hasn't been remotely adhered to. I mean, it is, but so are you, are you basically saying what Andrew Kaufman and company say about this, that you must I'm say, I'm take... saying the scientific method is not being remotely adhered to here. Okay. This is playing so, fast and loose, and it's relying uh -huh. on people not understanding this material in order to hoodwink them. And this is very well understood among scientists. Um, don't, and, don't, don't give me that, and, okay? That's just an appeal to authority fallacy. Mm, well, I'm saying we understand it. I mean, sure, it, it, doesn't okay. rest on, it doesn't rest on other people not understanding things. This is how these things are done. So uh, how, would you, how would you figure out if this patient of what is causing this patient's uh, pneumonia of unknown origin? Why are you asking me to figure out the cause of pneumonia? I am saying you are making it's a an claim. Exercise in, it's an exercise in like what, what these scientists, doctors have to go through in order to identify new pathogens. So is there another way other than what's listed here that you would want them to adhere to? When you to? say identifying new pathogen, that's called a begging the question fallacy. We have one person exhibiting pneumonia symptoms. Right, and then, and then we also have millions of other people exhibiting similar symptoms. They and are, this, and, this and never, never were these people with similar so, symptoms properly grouped together. In fact, they've been, the, yes. the CDC and WHO played so fast and loose with all of the numbers that there is absolutely no way to determine that there was a well-defined illness. So far, all we've got is nonspecific respiratory distress. No, it, it's very, so we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but this experiment described in this paper has been repeated several times all over the world. Even repeating it the first time doesn't seem to show anything. So one patient, you, you complain about one patient and then I tell you they repeat it with several other patients. I have two complaints. First, mm -hmm. obviously, if you're going to isolate a virus, you have to be able to isolate it without having to grow it. Otherwise, you're just you're just conjuring the you're just conjuring something in a lab. Two. Oh, so you can. So, okay. So, so two, can, I, can I address? All right. Okay. Go ahead. Go and and then two. Non-specific pneumonia doesn't even get you a good starting off point. And three, if you would please address why these these viruses obviously don't adhere to Koch's postulates. Okay. Uh, so starting with one. Um, you remind me, you said uh, you should be able to isolate it directly from a patient without having to grow it? Yes. So you can detect it in a patient without growing it. That's what the uh, RT-PCR, that's what antigen tests do. In order to actually okay. see it, in order to actually 
characterize it, you have to grow it and isolate it in a culture. So the only way to do that with a virus is to either have, I mean, an impractical volume of sample to purify a workable number of virions from, or you take a sample from one patient and put it into a cell culture so that those few viral particles can multiply to a volume that you can actually test. That you can actually- In other words, characterize. you're assuming that the vi- In other words, you're assuming that the viruses are there mm-hmm. and then well, you are putting them through polymerase chain reaction to grow what is there. No, polymerase chain reaction does not. So it, in detection, PCR does replicate and amplify the genome so that we can detect it. But in the case of culturing, we're not using PCR. We're just growing this virus in the cells. Okay, then why does it say RT-PCR there? That's detection. Okay. They detected, they detected the virus by RT-PCR, cytopathic effects, light microscopy, and uh, yeah, so presence of viral nucleic acid in the supernatant. So. so I don't want to get into the weeds too much on this, but we need to get a few things, make sure that the audience is very, very clear on these things. One, this supposed identification and isolation of the SARS-CoV-2 virus as the cause for pneumonia in one patient has an enormous number of steps between actually isolating a virus and then, because no, no virus is, is isolated at the point of extraction. Putting through the centrifuge reveals absolutely nothing. Then those cells are put into cancer cells, which are then repeatedly sh- repeatedly put through this, this, this uh, phosphate buffered saline over and over again, plus 150 <clears throat> microliters of the supernatant from the bronchioalveolar levo- mucus, basically, just sputum. And so what I'm, what I'm pretty sure that we're going to have to get to next, but what my audience is going to want to know is, how on earth does going through all these steps with one patient in any way show anything? So, so this one patient was part of a larger group of patients that were originally ill with an unknown pneumonia. So with one patient... How many patients? I mean, it was originally that felt ill. It was... In the first cluster, it was less than 10 who were admitted to the hospital, if I remember right, but it soon grew to what we now see as millions of cases. No, 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 no. So, I mean... No, 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 no. You have 10 again, patients. You have 10 patients, okay? And of course, I, I also want to be very, very clear that any kind of PCR testing doesn't actually identify infection of any kind. The inventor of that's, PCR that's, testing that's, made, made sure to point that out. That's not true. So we'll, we can get to that if what we you, want. Did, did, what, you think I'm lying about what Carrie Mullis said about PCR I'm testing? Lying, I'm, very, I'm very familiar with Kelly, Carrie Mullis, but what you said is not true. So we can get to that if we want, but let's, uh, let's go here. So this experiment was done with one patient to identify a new virus. And it was repeated with several patients who all had this, were part of this cluster of unknown caused pneumonia. So they do these steps because this is what you have to do in order to isolate a virus. No, 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 no. I I get that the steps for isolating a virus are these. Mm -hmm. I'm saying they look like you're just conjuring cell death in a lab. No. Okay. So so what it seems to say on the paper though. So what, what, what do you think is killing the cells? Stop asking me to provide the alternative explanation. What I'm asking you to do is to prove the explanation here. And all I'm seeing here is the conjuring of cell death in a lab on cells that are already obviously abnormal. So you, so you are, you have a problem with the methods clearly. Obviously. uh, Yeah. So I'm asking you, if you think that it's conjuring cell death in the lab, what do you think the scientists are adding to conjure the cell death? I don't need to answer the question. There are enough yes, steps do, in there. You, you, look, you, you are saying that you are pointing out a specific problem that you think exists with these methods. I'm asking you why you think that. Because they don't adhere to the scientific method. 
because first you have to observe a naturally occurring phenomenon to adhere to the exactly. scientific methods. You have pneumonia. That is not a well-defined a unknown naturally cause. Occurring. The question is, what is causing the pneumonia? You're, so okay. to figure that out is what this is designed to do. It's not a special pneumonia. Okay, it's not a it's not a it's pneumonia an that has different cause. characteristics from other pneumonias. It's just but non-specific pneumonia. That's not sufficient to begin the scientific method. You can normally find a cause for pneumonia, be it bacteria or viral. In this case, they did not know. And there was a cluster of patients who all had unknown pneumonia. That's concerning. So they set out to find the cause. Okay. And second, the only way. In my opinion, and I think I think a lot of science, you know, a lot of scientists would back me up on this. The only way to do this would be to adhere to Koch's postulates. Now, if you're talking about just ten people who were put through this Rube Goldberg way of extracting cells, of extracting sputum, and then putting it on cancer cells, and then watching the well, cancer cells die, I'm sorry, that's just not sufficient to prove the existence of any kind of pathogen. So before, before we move on, I just want to add that this can be done not just with cancer cells, but any cell line that can be infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's, it doesn't have to be cancer cells if that's problematic to you. You're just asserting that. I mean, the same thing has been repeated with multiple different cell lines, and you get the same virus with the same genome back. I don't think so. Okay, well, it's been done. I can show you those papers if you like, but... I'm just trying um, to get to the. I'm just uh, trying to get to the end of this thing. No, so so far, so far we have cancer cells flooded with sputum, and the cancer cells die. And we can observe specific cytopathic effects and detect a specific genome from them, and we can also image the virus and sequence the genome. And by the way, I also want to point out that even if we get even getting to the, back, the bottom of this, we are talking about one person with pneumonia. Which has been repeated several times. It's not- Okay, how many, how many times? First of all, here's the, here's the disconnect that we have and that my audience is going to want to point out. What happened in this case is suppose, you know, something happened here with this, with this study in, uh, with one patient, one pneumonia patient in Wuhan. You point out maybe it happened several more times. In my opinion, doesn't show anything. And then okay, how many times does it have to happen in order to show something? You know what? We'll get to that. But okay. it kind of has to be every time, especially given the fact that the way that, and this is the, the, this is, in my opinion, the most unforgivable scandal of this whole fraud mm -hmm. has been the, the use of these PCR tests at 45 cycles to produce 100%, or at least in my opinion, 100% false positives to create a health panic worldwide. Uh -huh. Now, okay. uh -huh. obviously the connection between whatever's going on in this one pneumonia patient who has his sputum then tossed on top of other people's cancer cells, uh, whatever's going on there is irrelevant to giving people ridiculous PCR tests that show exactly nothing. And by the way, there is no getting past the fact that the inventor of the PCR test said that the PCR test can never be used to detect infection. And two, even Dr. Anthony Fauci himself said anything over 24 cycles is completely unscientific. And these tests were done at 45 cycles. All that happened here was an enormous fraud was perpetrated on the people of the world using a 45 cycle PCR test. And because people didn't know any better, they took these tests at fake face value fake value in this case. Okay, so I guess, do you wanna get into PCR now or, uh, or should we try to stay on this paper? I just want you to give my audience any reason to believe that, any reason to believe that anything you're showing them is anything other than flim flam artistry. Okay, so I guess we can just talk about PCR. So Carrie Mollis did say that the PCR test should not be used for diagnostics. He said that years after uh, the test was actually developed. And he said it, one, while he was uh, also an AIDS denialist, he also- That's, re it, that's religious rhetoric. Okay, I, so- don't, don't, Listen, that, listen, listen I, 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 really, I really am not interested in your talking to my audience like you're a priest, okay? So, okay, so 
just hold on now. You you said I appealed with her authority earlier. You know, you're appealing to Carrie Mullis' authority right now. So I'm explaining that. I'm talking you know, about the one, use of the word denialist. It's very religious rhetoric. Oh, okay. Using. So okay. So um he denies the existence of HIV. And he also wrote in his own patent that a, a use for PCR is diagnostics for both bacteria and viruses. So he went against his own patent when he said that. And scientists have gone on to further develop the PCR technique into quantitative PCR, which can absolutely be used for diagnostic purposes and has been used that way for decades. Yes, in order to make people think that they have a virus they don't have. Okay. So why do you think the PCR test is not okay for diagnostics? Because the inventor of the test said that it's not okay for diagnostics. And then the person, so who, and, then the per, and then of course, you also know that the person who supposedly invented the fraudulent 45 cycle PCR test that has been used to defraud the entire world, a guy named Dresden himself isn't even a doctor or, or anything at all. Um, okay, well, no. <laughs> so you should look into that guy. So you can't even me. you can't even verify that he has any scientific knowledge of any kind. He's a PhD. Yes, it's a fake PhD. Dig into it. Okay, so um, you're you're telling me that the PCR test is not fit for diagnostics because of because someone said so, even because though he because contradicts the inventor, his patent. Well, I think it helps a little bit that the inventor of it said so, and two, even even, even though Dr. he contradicts his patent, I'm I'm using your own people. I'm using Dr. Anthony Fauci, who has said anything over twenty four tests is completely is completely junk science. And then, he didn't say that. Uh, yes, he did. Absolutely, I'm not called junk science. No. So there's nuance with PCR, called it something. Right? There's mm -hmm. nuance with P I know I know what you're referring to. He was talking about whether or not someone is infectious with the virus, and they and they get a PCR test that had a positive result of anything over than 25 cycles. So infectiousness of a person is different from a real confirmed positive result. He did not say that anything over 25 cycles is not a real result. His, ex his exact words were, "Is a, anything over that is a false positive, sorry. Mm -mm -mm. He's wrong when he says that. If okay, that's so now Fauci's, Fauci's wrong too, huh? Yeah, if that's what he said, then that's, that's incorrect. And okay, I don't so think you're saying, said okay, so, so we're gonna have to compare authorities here. Uh, now, as far as I'm not appealing to authority, you're, you're making the claim on your own authority, as far as I can tell. No, I'm uh, making the claim on data. Uh, okay, no, we have the inventor of the PCR test saying that this test is not is not in any way useful for detecting infection because it can't distinguish between a lot between living and dead tissue. So Second, are you ignoring the fact that he said that on his patent that he wrote with other scientists that it can be used for diagnostics and that he demonstrated that it can be used for diagnostics in the patent. I'm just going with what he said towards the end of his life. So you're appealing to his authority, okay. In this case, I am definitely going to, I'm going to be citing the inventor of the PCR test, yes. Second, so we have Anthony okay. Fauci saying that anything over 35 cycles is a false positive. And he said that in public. And Was now we have this buzz, and now, uh, it was it was 35 according to the source i'm looking 35 at. okay yeah. so that can be considered reasonable if it's anything over 35 okay well the dresden test was 45 cycles so it's quantitative it's done in real time that doesn't mean anything so do you yeah so in real real time pcr right is every single cycle takes a measurement so at every measure at every cycle you have the potential to identify either positive or negative. So if someone tests positive for the coronavirus from a reverse transcript PCR test, then they, the CT value could be 20, it could be 18, it could be 25. It could be all of those things, even though the test ran for 40 cycles. I know, and it's the threshold. And you, and you, can, you can know you can know that you can know that from looking up the data because again, it's recorded in real time. Okay. The data isn't recorded. All that happens is a medical that is. profession. 
it's not available. I, I, to the I do running these, the test. I do these tests. It is recorded. You can see the data in real time. It, it comes out as a curve. Okay, but in reality, all that's happening is a test is saying positive or negative. Well, no. there is a threshold placed for the CT value. That 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 positive or negative is determined by the clinical lab, which sees the data and uses that data to interpret their conclusion. Yes, and I'm telling you that those values were set pretty obviously at this point. Those values were which, which values were set? The, the the threshold for positivity and negativity and the number of cycles. Okay. You mean what, what, what counts as a positive? Yes. No. Yes. So, so different, so different clinical diagnostic laboratories will generally consider something out in the range of high thirties to not be positive. Okay. Well, what would be positive? So if you see a positive result, that is within a reasonable range. So what's the reasonable range? Below, let's say below 35. It depends on the platform and the clinical lab. Being below 35, okay. below 35 what? Cycles. Okay. So again, it depends on the clinical laboratory and the platform that they use. Each clinical laboratory standardizes their own test within their own lab. So it might not be the same across platforms. Okay, now, so now I can't make a blanket statement. We know that 45 cycles is not going to give you anything but false positives. No. That's because... the part That's the part where my audience is just looking at this and saying, what ridiculous fraud has been perpetrated on us? Why did they set oh. the cycles to 45? It's not. <laughs> it is. That's what the Dresden no. test was set to. That's well, it, it's well so known. The, so the Corman Drosten paper they did their initial testing with 45 cycles. In a clinical setting, it is not used at 45 cycles. The upper limit, for, uh, as far as I'm aware, is 42 cycles for a okay. clinical lab. But again, notion, it's done in real so, time. So, you, so you're telling me that 42 cycles took place, but 45 didn't. That's what you're saying. Depending on the clinical laboratory. Okay, so you're saying that each clinic tests differently. Do you have any kind of data on how many of these would have to be false positives at 42 cycles? Because because I know that that yeah. Kerry Mullis himself said ninety seven percent after twenty five. He's wrong, because you can have a PCR test. I, I do these tests, Patrick. They cut. You can have them run out to forty cycles and still get a negative, even though you know there's some genetic material there. Okay, so what you're saying is that they might not be false positives. Is what you're saying? They're definitely not. They're, oh, they're false definitely false. not. That false, false positives are extremely rare with this test. Sure they are, dude. Okay, so no. that's a begging the question fallacy. Now, at 45 I mean, cycles, <laughs> it's it's ridiculously high on the number of on the number of false positives. What what's That's just number? that's just well known. That's even stated by 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 members of your profession. Who's who says it's well known? Where where is it? Where's that data? I don't have it right in front of me right now, but yeah, I, okay. I am You can look it up. Um if you want. Okay. So what we have so far is one person with pneumonia. Okay. So we're back. His, to uh, yeah. I'm just going to, I'm summarizing now because I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I think that my audience has gotten a really good idea where you stand, where okay. I stand, and then they can make make up their own minds. But what we have so far, and I think this is the, the crux of what we're talking about. And, and I also want to say, I really think that you've stated your case here as well. So I don't want to I don't want to take away from your presentation or anything like that. But okay. what we have is one patient with pneumonia and then several more repeated which you've pointed out that have had their own bronchoalveolar lavage put on top of, of some some in your words immortal cells, I would say lung cancers cells with lung cancer or lung cancer cells. And then uh, okay, well, I would need to take a look at that as well. But my natural reaction would be, okay, they, they've conjured cell death in a lab. And then second, the PCR tests, which according to the people who, in the, pe the person who invented it, and then, and then of course, you know, according to other people who talk about the, the various thresholds that are set, they yield false positives 
on a level that it's like 97%. So, and then your simple response is no, you do PCR tests all the time and false positives are extremely rare. That's your, that's your response. Well, I know exactly why they're rare and I can explain that to you if you would like. Go right I mean, there's no, there's no basis for saying that they're 97% false positive. There's, I don't know where you're getting that. The, the, positive, the positivity rate uh, for tests done in the US never, I believe never rose past 15% of total test positive being done. So I don't understand how, how you think that uh, PCR done this way can yield a 97% false positive when only about 15 per, peak 15% of tests done at one time in the US have turned up positive. I mean, that's what the people who invented the, that's what the guy who invented the test said. And that anything over 35 cycles is just a false positive. Even Fauci said that. I, I don't know how many times I have to repeat this. So it, it's not, I, you're, I don't understand where you're getting the data from is my problem. Dr. Anthony I mean, I know you're Fauci. saying that. So, Saint Fauci himself you, said this. Yeah, so uh, if you get a fault, if you get a positive above 35 cycles, it might be a false positive. In that case, the lab should either retest your sample or you should, you know, take some other action. Okay, well, listen, in order to get a certain what, what answer. What really happened during this what really happened during this global ludicrous panic is nobody was retested. You just got a false positive yeah, and it was immediately and then it was Im sure, and then it was immediately treated as gospel and people were quarantined and the world got shut down at 35 so, so, cycles, but these were set to, and you say 42, but I'm hearing 45 from the Dresden test, the, from the from this, this, this so fake that was, scientist out of Germany. So the Corman, listen, the Corman Drosten paper tested, was trying to test the concept of it. They tried to establish that this PCR can work. Okay, they didn't, that, te, that publication was not then copy and pasted into clinical labs, okay? That's not what clinical labs used. Okay, they so you're saying that clinical labs- And they did not use 45 cycles. So clinical labs made their own determination as to number of cycles and CT threshold. So yeah, clinical labs have to establish that on their okay, own. Okay, so platform. what are the, so what was the universal established standard? Again, there's no universal because- That doesn't sound, that doesn't sound very scientific to me. No, it, it's established on each platform and each platform has to use this, specific standards and meet specific criteria. Those are the universal things, the standards and the criteria. What the results actually look like will might depend on what platform you're using. I can put you in touch with a, a clinical laboratory scientist who can uh, talk to you about this if you like. Um, so just to, just, to, just to sum up, we have the a small number of patients with- Large cluster in the, in the beginning. A number of patients whose cells uh, a number of patients whose sputum was exposed to cancer cells and then the cancer cells died. We have a PCR test that is being given varying thresholds, but we also know that anything above 35 cycles is extremely questionable. And we used these pieces of information to shut down the whole world. There's much more to it than that, but I mean, well, that's we've had, we've had that's a, part of We've had a solid 55 minutes to talk about this. What do you say we do this? My audience is going to get a chance to look at it. I'll be delighted to send this to you as well, if you'd like it. Uh, sure, and, then, and then I will, uh, and maybe we could schedule another one and uh, have another chat about this while I look into the things that you've said to me. And uh, maybe, you, uh, maybe you look into it as well. But I think that, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, that both of us have gotten a chance to air out our side of the discussion. Would you, would you agree to that? Um, sure. I'm, we've we've gotten yeah, a chance sure. to have our say, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate your coming on the show, Daniel. Uh, and if we can do it again, that would be great. You know, my email address, my audience will be seeing this tonight. And I really appreciate your coming on the reading Epic Threads live stream. Okay. Sure. Yeah. And I just want to say that, uh, I appreciate you being willing to have a debate. Not everybody, absolutely. Who, not everybody who, uh, disagrees with me on this stuff would, is very, uh, cooperative in that. So I do appreciate that. And uh, if you want to do it again, I'm down.
Damn right, sir. We will do it again. Let's let's uh, let's set it up, and I will talk to you when we do. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. You too.